Hello everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we're in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Going through the Bible, verse by verse, we come, as I said, to Deuteronomy chapter 9, which is where we'll begin our study in just a minute. I'll let you get your Bible, hopefully, so you can open it up and follow along. While you're doing that, I will tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Now, you can study the entire Bible using my audio Bible commentaries at the website, the Bible verse by verse dot com. In fact, you can study the entire Bible three times through, from Genesis through Revelation. Again, it is verse by verse. So it's a, it's a pretty big challenge. It'll take you a while, but it'll be worth it. It's always worth it to be in the Word of God, and you will know Jesus better than you ever have in the past. And your faith will increase and your joy will increase from being in the Word of God. So check it out. Use it at thebibleversebyverse.com. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy, chapter 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fenced up to heaven. So Moses isn't downplaying the challenge, humanly speaking, anyway, the challenge. He's saying, look, these people are big. They are tough. There were many Nephilim in the land. Those were giants. Um, Cities were huge. They were well fortified. I mean, this, this is a very intimidating thing. If you're just looking at your opponent. Because he goes on in verse 2, a people great and tall. The children of the Anakims, they were the Nephilim. That gene that came from the offspring of the fallen angels and human women. Genesis chapter 6 was carried through Ham's wife on the ark. And they began to spring up again in the promised land. These are giants. Children of the Anakims, whom you know, and of whom you have heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? And, uh, well, David did. A little later on, didn't he? Stood before the big guy, Goliath. But... You know, Moses, he doesn't water anything down. He, you know, he says, this is the way it is. I'm just being honest with you. When it comes to size and strength and fighting skill, their enemy is a first-class, top-notch opponent. And Israel wasn't very good, to be honest with you. They're a bunch of shepherds. And, of course, when Israel discovered this, He's not telling them anything that they don't already know. When their parents discovered this 40 years earlier, they panicked. And undoubtedly, Moses is trying to cushion the shock a little right here on their children, this second generation. Look, you know what you're coming up against here. Verse 3. Understand, therefore, this day that the Lord your God is he which goes before you. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before your face. So shall you drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said unto you. And there's the great equalizer. Yeah, the enemy is superior. But their defeat is still a sure thing. They're going down. So as Israel rolls up their sleeves and starts fighting, God would get to work and actually destroy the enemy, which was way too difficult. 
for his people to defeat. And always remember, nothing is too difficult for God, and nothing shall be impossible for the Lord, the Bible says. Humanly speaking, this was a lost cause for Israel. You add God to the mix, it's a sure victory. God can do anything. So when you pray for something, keep in mind that God can do anything. No matter how impossible it may seem, God can do anything. So if you pray, you are handing that petition over to him. You are handing that issue over to him like a quarterback hands the ball to a running back. Then it's in the running back's hands. The quarterback doesn't sit back and fret. There's nothing he can do about it. It's up to the running back to carry the ball. When you pray, you've handed the ball off to God. You've handed the situation off to God. And no one can stop him. No one can. No obstacles can stop him. No plan or purpose of God can be thwarted. So if he doesn't do something that you ask him to do, it's because he doesn't want to. And if he doesn't want to, it's for your own good. But just look at these giants. It was impossible for Israel to beat them. But God says, they're going to lose because I'm going in there with you. Verse 4, speak not thou in your heart after that the Lord your God has cast them out from before you, saying, for my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord does drive them out from before you. Not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart do you go to possess this land. But for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord your God does drive them out from before you. And that he may, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, Israel is going to get the victory. And it's, it's going to be an amazing victory against these Nephilim. Tough as nails, huge. But when it's all over, Israel was not to become conceited after seeing how God worked on their behalf. Don't start feeling good about yourself. I mean, I'm sorry to tell you that, but all this talk about self-esteem and self-worth that we hear in so many modern evangelical churches is completely and totally unbiblical. It has absolutely no place in any sermon by anyone who claims to believe the Bible because you can't find that in the Bible. The only thing you find when it comes to worth is God's worth. And we are never, ever to be conceited. We are never, ever, the Bible says, to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And what are we? According to Romans, we have altogether become worthless. That magnifies God's grace. I know, you know, I mention this quite a bit. But, you know, God talks about it a lot, like he is right here. That's why I mention it. You say, well, you need to be more balanced. I am the balance. Because you go into most evangelical churches today and you hear self-worth, self-esteem, self-actualization, self, self, self. I am the balance because I'm telling you that that stuff is wrong. I'm giving you the other side. I'm giving you the Bible side, God's side. Israel was not to become spiritually conceited after seeing how God worked on their behalf. If they think God fights for them because they are so good, if that's what they start thinking, they're going to be out of the land of promise. And they're, because they're living in the land of make-believe, they'll be out of the land of promise before too long. Verse 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. There was no reason for self-righteousness in Israel. Aren't we wonderful? God fought for us. No, it has nothing to do with that. Their victories were due to the grace of God, period, end of story. Verse 7. Remember and forget not how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. 
from the day that you did depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also at Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. And that's probably talking about the golden calf thing. Of course, you could take your pick, pick a card, any card. They all spell the rebellion of Israel. He could have destroyed them before he got them out of Egypt. He could have destroyed them. So, man, don't think so highly of yourself. Oh, we were blessed by God. God fought for us because we were so wonderful. God gives them a little bit of a history lesson here in advance of them even thinking about going in that direction in their mind. Now, I will say this. I don't think it's right to wallow in our past sins. I don't think God wants that. He doesn't want us to do that. But it's a good idea to remember and never forget, as he says, remember and never forget just how rotten and sinful each one of us have been. Don't live in that, but always have it in the back of your mind, along with the forgiveness and mercy and unconditional love of God to sort of balance it out. But keep in, keep in mind that he loves you because it's his nature to love, not because you've been so wonderful, because we haven't been. And this is what he's trying to get across to Israel. If Israel remembers their past sins, they won't even think about becoming self-righteous. There are, there are two types of people in this world. Number one, those who remember their sin are embarrassed and humbled by it. And those who put a positive spin on it. And that's wrong. Making up excuses for it. Blaming someone else for it. Pretending that they are good and becoming self-righteous as a result. Verse 9. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire and the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Moses was fasting and praying for 40 days. Remember that? On Mount Sinai. And meanwhile, while he was doing that, preparing to receive the law from God, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, just drawing closer to God than he ever had been before. Meanwhile, the people below the hill were committing fornication and idolatry. So much with a, for, a, for a positive self-esteem. We'll just put an end to that before you even go there. That's why God is reminding them of this stuff. Not so, not so that they would wallow in their past sins. Like I said, God doesn't want us to do that, but he still, he never wants, to remember, never wants us to forget that we are unworthy of his mercy and his goodness. And that would go with them defeating the enemy in the promised land because that's what this is about. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto me, Arise, Get thee down quickly from hence, for your people which you have brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. That was the golden calf thing. That is the story that Moses is, is uh, reminding them of. 13. Furthermore, the Lord spoke unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. I think God wasn't telling Moses anything that he didn't already know as the leader of this unruly bunch. 
But then God said this in verse 14, Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you a nation mightier than, and greater than they, because God could have done that. And that's the power of Almighty God. So, self-righteous Israel? I don't think so. The ink wasn't even dry on the Ten Commandments, and they were breaking them already. And God was so angry that he wanted to wipe them all out on the spot. Verse 15, So I turned, and I came down from the mount. And the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. How can they be down there worshiping a golden calf when the mountain is smoking and burning with the presence of Almighty God, when they had heard the voice of God, how can they be doing this? It is amazing the power of our sin nature. Amazingly horrifying is what it is. In verse 16, Moses goes on with this story. And I looked and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God and had made you a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And Moses never got in trouble for doing this. I mean, this was righteous indignation on the part of Moses. They were breaking the commandments. And so he took those tables with the commandments written on them and he smashed them right before them. You broke them, I'm breaking them. I'm breaking the tablets that you have despised. So, you know, the people, to say the least, were fickle. They were, a, they were a, a civil and spiritual Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Moses smashes the Ten Commandments, illustrating what Israel had also done. They smashed them. They annihilated them. 18. And I fell down before the Lord, as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I did, I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins, which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Moses must have been skin and bones, all the fasting he did on behalf of his people. That was a good leader. Verse 19, For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was angry against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. Moses pleaded for the Lord to spare Israel, and God heard his prayer. Don't ever underestimate your prayer. If you're walking with Jesus and you don't have any unconfessed sins in your life and you're living for Jesus and you have a close walk with him, never underestimate the power of your prayer. Number one, I can tell you this, God hears you. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing right there, just knowing that God hears you because like I said earlier, then, then the ball's in his court. Then, he, then he's going to run with it and do whatever he knows is best. But to me, you look at verses 18 and 19, you're looking at a genuine hero here. This is a hero. Moses was horrified over Israel's sin of idolatry and fornication. And he was terrified too because God was about to execute them. And as a result, Moses falls on his face and prays and ask, actually rescues these people from destruction again. And these people couldn't stand Moses. He was still good to them. You know, God says, God says uh, Moses, stand back. I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'm going to start all over with you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And don't you think that was tempting for Moses? No more putting up with all this stuff. Smooth sailing the rest of my life. There's got to be something inside of Moses that thought, you know, God, I think that's a real good idea. But he cared about the people and he also cared about God. Verse 20, And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also. The same time, boy, people didn't have a better friend than Moses. He was there for them. He prayed for them. 
That's the best friend in the world. If you got somebody who prays for you every single day, that's, that's the best friend you got. Aaron never had a better friend than his little brother Moses. 21. And I took, and I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descends out of the mount, crushing, grinding, and scattering was the end of that idol. And it should have been the portion and the destiny of those who reveled in it as well. And it would have been if it hadn't been for Moses and his prayers on behalf of those sinners. Don't just pray for people that you think are worthy of being prayed for. Pray for anyone who the Lord lays on your heart to pray for. And if you can't think of anything that they have done that makes them worthy at all of being prayed for, just remember that you're not worthy either and I'm not worthy either. And you can always pray for their salvation. Verse 22. Here we go again, and at Tabera, and at Massa, and at Kirbroth Hatava, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Well, and that was found in Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Self-righteous? Think highly of yourself, guys. Think that that's why God is going to give you the victory over these giants? No, don't even go there. Moses could have went on indefinitely with story after story talking about Israel's sinfulness. 23, likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. You know, you'd think that the golden calf thing would have changed Israel the punishment, all the people that they saw die because of that. But no, it didn't. The sequel to that one was a real beaut. They refused to enter the promised land that God said he would fight and give it to them. And that was this current generation's parents, the prior generation. 23. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandments of the Lord your God, and you believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. And then verse 24. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. That's all they've been. He is shooting down any self-esteem that Israel might have, isn't he? He is shooting down any self-worth that they might have. Don't tell me God wants you to do that, to have that. Don't, don't tell me that God wants you to go to a church and support a pastor who talks about that kind of rot, that unbiblical, ungodly, immoral, God-dishonoring, sinful man-honoring, putrid garbage. Just about every memory of Israel had rebellion connected to it. 25. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights as I fell down at the first because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not your people and your, your inheritance, which you have redeemed through your greatness, which you have brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Destroy them not. 
Israel hurt God many, many times. Moses wouldn't blame God for doing it. They hurt Moses too. Moses never wanted this job in the first place. Remember? Way back in the beginning, he didn't want this job. He kept trying to talk God out of it. Don't give it to me. And after 40 years of having this job, I'm sure he hadn't changed his mind. But he's got it. And he's in the will of God. So as long as he's in the will of God, whether he likes it or not, he's going to do the best that he can. He's going to do what he feels is right for God's glory. And that's what he's doing with this prayer. Moses, Moses was hurt by these people, but he isn't bitter. He prays, Lord, don't be quick to pull the trigger here. Have mercy on them. 27, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Moses says, Lord, don't look, don't notice, don't concentrate on our sin. Shift gears. Think about what you told Abraham, our forefather, when you promised to make us a great nation, give us this promised land. Think about that. Remember your word. Moses reminds God of his word. Not a bad idea. In fact, that's a pretty good idea. If your prayers are based on the word of God, they're dynamite. That's why one of the best ways to pray is to pray with an open Bible. Read the Word, pray. Read the Word, pray. Have a two-way conversation between you and God. 28, lest, now look at, look what else God, or Moses says to God. Lest the land whence you brought us out of, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he heard them, hated them, I should say, he has brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people. And your inheritance, which you brought out by your mighty power and by your stretched out arm. Moses said, if you destroy Israel, God, and God had every right in the world to do it. But he says, if you destroy Israel, God, it just won't look good. It won't look good for you. You look like a weak God, like you weren't able to start or finish what you started with these people. So don't do it, God. Don't you just love Moses? My goodness. He was so unselfish. The Bible says he was the meekest man who ever lived, and I believe it. He's in a miserable situation with these people. And yet he prays for their good. He prays for mercy. And he also prays the prayer that he thinks will benefit God the most. Now that's, that's good prayer right there. I'm out of time. You can continue studying the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, listen, and follow along as I teach it verse by verse. First time visitor, I say go to Genesis. Begin in chapter 1 of book 1 and go through all 66 books of the Bible systematically and get until you get through Je Revelation. Study the whole Bible, but do it however you want to do it, and however you want to do it, just do it. Because you need the Word of God, and it'll bless you. And it'll draw you closer to God, and you'll get the strength and the faith you need to please Him, and that's what's most important. The Bible verse by verse dot com. And if the Word of God blesses you, if it feeds you, then I ask you to bless me back. I am brought to you by your prayers and financial support, period. That's it. No large church, no large denomination, nothing undergirds this ministry except God and people like you who love his word. And so if you choose to give, you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button and give in a secure way as the Lord might lead. Or you can write scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, zip code 53074. See you next time.